Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter, chapter 40. Now let's read um, verses 1 and 2 together. Verses 1 and 2 reading. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received the Lord's hand double for all her sins. May God bless the reading of his word. Now, well, several have asked, here is a situation where God declares forgiveness. Look at verse 2. Um, her iniquity is pardoned. Her iniquity is pardoned. God declares forgiveness. Although there is no record of repentance on Israel's part. All right? So, well, then the question is, well, does God forgive um, without us repenting? Because... Now, turn to Deuteronomy chapter... Oh, sorry. Um, turn to Psalm 66, verse 8. But you know that. Well, that's just to read, let me read to you. Psalm 66, 18. We covered this at church camp. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So, how is it that they had... Well, if they did not repent, they did not well, cry to the Lord and seek forgiveness and ask God to forgive them. But how is it that God would actually just... Um, declare that their iniquity is pardoned. All right. Now, what about Deuteronomy chapter 11? Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 27. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 27. All right, let's read 27 and 28 together. Reading. A blessing... If ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse, if ye will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day, to go after other gods which ye have not known. You see, so the thinking is, well, if God says that when we disobey him, there is curses, um, then how is it here that, well, God just forgive like that? So how do we reconcile this, these ideas? Maybe I ask you, how? Here God just declare, well, they are forgiven. Tell them that their sins are pardoned. How do you reconcile? All right? You understand the question, right? Maybe I ask um, the teens. Um, well, teens. Uh, Cornelius, you understand the question? God just say forgive. So you, you, you are naughty and then you disobey daddy and then all that. After that, daddy say, I forgive. I've forgiven your, your disobedience. Say, yay, I don't need to obey God. Uh, obey daddy. Not sure. Okay. Maybe I ask uh, Matthew, what about you? What do you think? You understand the question? You don't understand the question. All right. God simply says, I forgive their iniquity. But then what about, well, their disobedience? What about God says, if you have iniquity in your heart, I will not hear you. How is it that God just says, oh, I forgive you? Gracia, you understand the question? Okay. So what do you think? Why do you think it's like that? Not sure as well. Maybe I'll ask the older teens then. Um, uh, CP. It's congruent. How? Letter part verse 2. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double of all her sins. How is it congruent? Okay, well, well, in the first place, um, God says, um, a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, right? So, it is correct because look at verse, verse 2, uh, verse 1. 
of chapter 40, sorry, verse 2. Now I say, for she hath received the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now God did say she has been given chastisements. In fact, the chastisements for their idolatry, God says she suffered double. So God actually um, um, chastised them very, very hard, double amount. So God did chastise them. There were consequences for their disobedience. So in that sense, um, God is consistent. He said, I will chastise when you disobey. Um, and God says they were doubly chastised. They went through the chastisement. But it still remains that, um, well, but God just declare forgiveness. Will God just simply forgive us when, well, we did not go to him to seek forgiveness, to, to, to repent of our sin? And worse, if, if I have sinned in my heart, then I just go pray to God. Anyway, God, God forgives me without me asking for forgiveness. But yet God says, well, I won't hear you if you regard iniquity in your heart. How do you resolve that part? You understand the question, right? What about Hazel? Understand the question? Is it because God chastises us for the sake of driving us to repentance? Is it? Okay. Thomas, ask the Father. Agree with who? Uh, Mabel. Um, Mabel, they even call Mabel. <laughs> <laughs> or you can read Mabel's mind, okay. <laughs> I asked Mabel what she thinks. That. All right, Mabel, you're in trouble now. He agrees with what he telepathically heard from your mind. Better be the right answer then. <laughs> Forgiveness is about restoration, sorry? About restor a Forgiveness that will have a restoration that occurs later. Okay. Thomas, you agree with her. What does it mean? I don't understand. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. I'm just teasing you. You agree with CP, right? You agree with CP. But so, what do you mean, um, Mabel? Is it the same as what CP said? Not sure. Sounds plausible. What about Benedict? Because this is something that we, we wonder, hey, does it mean if I, don't, I didn't go to God and, and confess my sin and I still have this sin in my life, God will still hear me. God seems to be willing to forgive. And if you forgive, then God will hear my prayers, right? Then I don't have to repent. Oh, God was dealing with Israel as a nation. As a nation, is it? So this is not about individual sin. But then as a nation, if they don't repent, then why would God say, oh, forgiven as a whole nation? Okay, last person. Last person. The, okay, Jemima, you look deep in thought. You understand the question? Yeah. yeah. Maybe the record of their repentance will come later. Oh, recorded somewhere else. Okay, maybe, but there was... But there's still the idea that God simply declared their sins are forgiven. Now, how do we reconcile this? I just want to ask one last person. Uh, uh, Nathan. Oh, okay. Now, when you look at this, there are a few things that we need to learn. First and foremost, God did not contradict Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 28. All right? God doubly um, chastised them. All right? So there was chastisement. But what about if they did not cry to God and God just a blanket declaration, just go and tell them their sins are forgiven. In such situation, now how do we understand this? Now, first and foremost, Remember, Israel is in covenant with God, correct? It's a covenantal relationship. And what kind of covenantal relationship is this, uh, Alex? 
Very good. It's a suzerainty relationship, suzerainty covenant. But so what? <laughs> like, All right, so, uh, so, so young ones, please understand the word suzerainty, all right? It's not uh, someone's name called Susan, all right? Suzerainty means um, is God is the sovereign and the ruling party in this covenant. God is the one who decides, and God is the one who maintains. Please remember two things. God is the one who decides, and God is the one who maintains the covenant. Always remember that. Our covenant of grace, who maintains it? Um, who maintains this covenant of grace? Uh, Phoebe, who maintains covenant of grace? God or you? God. Our salvation in the covenant of grace is simply and purely God chose, God forgave, and God will ensure that we will get to heaven. If, if it is a normal covenant, it means we must maintain it. it. means if we fail, it's finished. But suzerainty means God says, I will maintain. Now, that is why we must understand our salvation clearly. Now, young ones, I hope you understand this. Why do you obey God? Maybe I ask. Um, Caleb, why do you obey God? Because He saved us. It is not in order to remain saved. All right? We obey God simply because God saved us. So God sovereignly decided that He will save us and He will maintain that. Even when we fail, even like Israel, Israel failed. But God will draw Israel back. Like you and I, like we learned this morning, now when we, when we um, fall into sin, all right, does God cast away Israel? No, in BBK. Like you and I, when we fall into sin, does God say, then you, I unsafe you? No, He maintains the covenant. Now, how does he maintain the covenant? How? So when we get saved, we obey God because we are saved, not in order to remain saved. That is suzerainty covenant. So in this case, when, can God declare in this suzerainty covenant, can God declare, I have forgiven them? Can God declare that? Now you think about your salvation. Is it because we chose to repent, then God decided to save us, number one. Or number two, God decided to save us and then will God will cause us to repent. Which one? Uh, Matthew. The first one is, you decided to repent, so God chose to save you. Or, God chose to save you and therefore, He made you repent. First one or second one? You understand the question? Yes. So which one? Did Matthew say, I want to believe in God, so I want to repent. Then God says, oh, since you want to repent, I will save you. Or is it because you actually didn't want to repent, but God chose to save Matthew, and then God worked in Matthew's heart, and Matthew repented. Which one? Number one or number two? Number two. Number two. That's a suzerainty covenant. Covenant of grace is also suzerainty covenant. Your salvation is God declared that He will pardon you and therefore He worked in your life and then you repented, right? So, forgiveness is a prerogative of God. Now, what about... So, at that point, please, young ones, I hope you always remember. Huh? Maybe I ask Nathan. Where's Nathan? Young Nathan. Ah, oh, young Nathan, all right? Young Nathan. Um, if you want to go to heaven, Nathan, do you want to go to heaven? Yes. If you want to go to heaven... Um, what must you do? Believe in Jesus. But shouldn't you first be very obedient first, then believe in Jesus? Will obedience, no. Will obedience save you? Why not? Very good. Obedience will not save us because I still have not believed in Jesus. It's salvation by grace. Until we turn to Christ for forgiveness, all our works are useless. Your works can never save us. We, are, we turn to God, we get saved, and then our works are simply to ensure that we please God. That is all. So young ones, I hope that this is drilled into you. All right? I don't want you to go through church 
from a young age, keep thinking, well, I, as long as I keep obeying God, I will be saved. No, you must come to Jesus first. That is suzerainty covenant, all right? So God decided to, to save you. He turned you to himself. That is first. Now, what about after salvation? After salvation, what about that? Do you think that um, God forgive you and he must forgive you because you repent? Vichen? God's decision? Okay, I'm not talking, we, we repent whether it's truly repent. I'm talking true repentance. Now, we have to understand that when it comes to forgiveness in the suzerainty covenant, it's purely God's choice. That's why it's called suzerainty covenant. The lesson is this. When we repent, and receive forgiveness. We must never be proud. I repented. And therefore, God forgave me and God helped me. We must never have that concept. God's forgiveness is always God's prerogative. So, is it, so the lesson is, when we repent, we must not be proud that we repented and therefore God forgave us. The lesson is not, the lesson is not, and I repeat, the lesson is not encouraging us to continue to live in sin and expect that God will forgive us. I want to repeat, okay? The lesson is when we receive forgiveness, it is purely the grace of God. Before salvation, after salvation. Purely the goodness of God. That is all. God forgive us on the basis of His Son, not on the basis of our repentance on the basis of his son, first and foremost. But God is not teaching here. Whether Israel repent or not, um, I don't really care. I will forgive them anyway. That is not the lesson. Now, how do we know that? How do we know that? Um, because in the New Testament, now turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. This principle is carried all the way to the New Testament. Let's read verses 1 and 2 together. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in sin? You see, the principle is carried to the New Testament. Now, some Christians begin to think, well, you know, they understood that forgiveness is the graciousness of God before salvation and after salvation. And some began to think that, well, you know, any anyway, forgiveness is God's grace towards me. And therefore, I can keep sinning. If you have the idea that I can keep sinning, anyway, God's forgiveness is not contingent just upon my repentance. It's purely His graciousness. Then I can continue in sin. And Paul had to rebuke them. Don't have that idea. Yes, forgiveness of, is, is always by the grace of God. It's God's graciousness towards us. Repentance, and I hope you get this part. Repentance is our duty. It's the duty of men to repent. When God says, when you, if you regard iniquity in your heart, I will not hear your cries. Right? Your prayer. Repentance is the duty of men. Forgiveness is the graciousness of God. That is what it is. You must have be very clear in your heart. Otherwise, you can become proud. I'm a very good Christian to, uh, compared to others. That's why I'm forgiven more. My life is so smooth because I always repent. That's why God bless me. Don't think like that. In the suzerainty covenant, when God graciously forgave them, now you learn the lesson. Now, then you read Romans chapter 2, verse 4. You see, the New Testament explains the working of God. Romans Chapter 2, verse 4. Let's read together. All despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. What is the Apostle Paul saying? Now, when we have the idea, though it is correct that 
forgiveness is purely the riches of His goodness, the forbearance and His long-suffering towards us and God forgive, forgives. But you see, when you realise that, you must know that this goodness that God forgives you is to lead you to repentance. That is the message this morning. To know of God's faithfulness, God's kindness, graciousness, mercy is what must drive us to repent and be faithful to Him. That is scriptures. Now, then it means this. One of you got it right. When, when God, in the suzerainty covenant, chose to forgive after He had chastised them very severely, what do you think can happen after that? Okay, try to think. Huh? I'm asking again. When God, in His graciousness, chastised, um, um, forgave Israel, after chastising them severely. Now, actually, what was the response of Israel after this, based on Israel's history? Um, forget names. Uh, uh, Janelle, yes. I still want to call the person behind you, but I forgot the name, so it's you. Right, Janelle. Uh, do you understand the question? The question is this. From what you understand of the history, this was God telling them, go in the future, when I've, after I've cast them out of Israel, they live in Babylon, right? And then I will send my prophet say, your sins are forgiven, all right? And you've, you've suffered enough, your sins are forgiven. Do you remember what the children of Israel did? They, they come back to Christ. Uh, I'm not good at asking questions. Uh, when God forgave them, what did God do? They were in captivity in Babylon. Do you remember what did God do? Uh, Anna. Ah, do you remember your name now? Anna. Yes, can't run away. Anna. What did God do? When God said, tell them it's pardon. What did God do? They were in captivity. Yes. What did God do? This was the time that God said they will be in Babylon. Mm, they said Daniel was sometime before that. Well, God moved the heart of the king to release them from captivity, remember? God said, tell them a pardon, they will return. In fact, this chapter 40 is exactly that. Tell them that I will forgive them and I will bring them back to the land, correct? I will bring them back to the land. So that was exactly what God was saying in, the, in verses 3 onwards. So God says, I have chosen, after chastising them for a long period, I, would, I have chosen by my sovereign, my, so in my suzerainty covenant, that Israel will, will, will fulfill their purpose again. I will bring them back to Israel. Correct? Yeah, you all look very lost. You all know the history, right? We studied that. Now, then maybe I ask, ask, ask uh, JB. JB, all right, JB. Now, what did they, did the people go back to, 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 to Israel? They did. When they went back to Israel, what did they do? They rebuilt the temple. Why did they rebuild the temple? They really wanted to go back and worship God once again. Right? And serve God once again. Now, understand suzerainty covenant. The maintaining of Israel to continue to, to be in covenant and to serve God is maintained by God. And that God will say, is pardon, I will bring them back. Now the question is this. Did Israel repent? Did Israel repent? We know they did, according to JB as well, right? Did they say, no, God, we do not want to go back to Israel anymore. We're enjoying Babylon, so nice, so beautiful, so much nice food, so much, so much nice shopping centres and buildings, nicer than that ruin of a place of Jerusalem and broken temple. No, they did not do that. We studied earlier on in DHW, they packed their stuff, all right? Many of them gave money. And they, they travel. They took the risk to travel that long journey back. All right? No matter what, they said, we must go back. Did they repent? This is how God describes. Now he says, knowing, not, not, not knowing the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. When God declared, 
tell them their sins are forgiven. What was their response? It led them to repentance. They went back to Israel. So is it repentance, then forgiveness, or forgiveness, then repentance? There are both in scriptures. Both in scriptures. By and large, God expects that we repent. So don't, don't go and say, since both are, let me choose the second one. Hopefully God forgive me first. Please don't think like that. God's command is simple. All right? If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That is God's prerogative. Don't, don't say, well, I choose the second one. There is no such thing. Your duty is simply to repent. But at times, God, in God's graciousness, all right, He reaches out. Even after salvation, He reaches out. He, tell, he told them, you're forgiven. They were very thankful. You mean we can be forgiven? You mean we can return to the land? They were anxious. They packed their stuff and they went. And when they went back, they repented and they really rebuilt the temple. All right? They, they, they um, didn't have idolatry for, for a period. So the goodness of God leads us to repentance. In other words, this is what we must learn. The duty to repent is always ours. But never be proud that it's because of repentance that God forgive us. We must also realize that many times, even before you and I repent, in fact, I would say this, do you realize that God uses chastisement to cause you to repent? I think that's what CPU said, right? Uh, not you. Someone behind you. I don't know which one. Or someone said, God used the chastisements to cause them to repent. But God knew that they will repent and God forgave. And that stirred them. They were thankful. The message this morning is realize that there is forgiveness in God and His goodness leads us to repentance. His goodness must not lead us to, well, that grace may abound. God forbid. How can we continue in sin? All right? Now, so that is an important thing that the Christian must begin to realize don't be proud when you repent. Don't be proud when you repent. And when God is kind to you, gracious to you, before you even repent and you see God begin to work in your heart, it makes you, it must stir you to know that the goodness of God is to lead me to repentance. The goodness of God is not to make me think, anyway, God will forgive me, so I don't need to repent. It's not supposed to do that. Israel understood and Israel responded correctly. All right? So the Christian must know repentance is my duty. Forgiveness is the graciousness of God. I must never feel that my repentance is what um, um, made God beholden to forgive me. God can chastise me for longer. It's up to God. Right? Now, so that is something that the Christian uh, must learn. Please, I summarize before I go to the next question, which is related. Don't take this passage to teach ourselves to say, I don't need to repent, God will forgive. Because this is what the hyper grace movement teaches the hyper grace gospel. Now, young ones, listen carefully. There is a gospel out there that many of your friends may believe in. It's called the hyper grace gospel. What is hyper grace? Hyper grace means. Your sins, past, present, and future are forgiven. Is that true? Let me ask you. Han, do you think it's true? Your sins, past, present, and future are already forgiven. Is it true, theologically? Yes, it has to be. That is why salvation is by grace. That's why we are going to heaven. Not dependent on our works at all, correct? Our sins, past, present, and future are already forgiven, paid for on the cross completely. Our repentance is purely it's purely our responsibility not to secure salvation. Remember that. Now, our sins, past, present, and future are forgiven. That is true. But for them, they say, therefore, you do not need to repent. What's the point of confession and repentance? There's no point. Because God has already forgiven. God already knows what sin you will commit tomorrow, next week, when you grow up. God already knows that. And He's forgiven that. And therefore, you can continue to sin. So young ones... Don't ever believe your friends when they tell you that. God says the goodness of God is to lead you to repentance. The goodness of God that He has forgiven you, your sins, past, present and future, you are saved by grace. That goodness is not for you to 
continue in sin is to drive you to repentance. Remember that. All right, so young ones, I hope you remember. Don't believe in the hyper-grace gospel where you do not need to confess, you do not re- need to repent. It is our duty to do so. Not to secure salvation, but it's our duty to do so. Okay? Now, any questions for so far? No? Now, the next one. So, a person asked this, and definitely you can answer this already. Um, Actually, the person asked this. Now, so why do we tell unbelievers to repent in our preaching of the gospel? Why do we need to tell people to repent if God forgives? And in salvation, definitely God forgives us. So why do we need to tell people to repent if repentance is not required in that sense? Why? Maybe I ask Anna, the other Anna. Anna, why do you think when you share the gospel, we always say you must share Repent, or you shall likewise perish. But actually, now we learn that God is the one who moves towards us. God is the one who, who forgives first. So why must we keep telling people to repent, believe and repent? Why, Anna? Say again. Be- because? People need to turn to God and ask for forgiveness. Okay? Okay. Um, that's one reason. If a person doesn't turn to God to ask God for forgiveness, but they will say, but any way you say is, is God forgive first, right? So why do we need to tell them to repent? You understand the question? Uh, maybe I ask, wait, let me see, uh, Sing Yun. Repent from unbelief in God. <laughs> Okay, that's one of it. Repent for if you don't believe in God, then, then how can God save you, right? Okay, that's one. Now, why must we preach repentance? For the simple reason that Paul already said, God forbid that we should sin, that grace may abound. Now, repentance is this. Repentance is in your mind, you already you in your mind you say, This is sin, I don't want sin, I turn away from sin, I don't don't want to continue in sin. That is repentance. The change of mind first. Your attitude and your view of sin. Now, if that is something that the believer or the person say, I, I intend to continue in sin. I intend to um, enjoy sin. But I want God to forgive me. The person cannot be saved. Because God already said, my goodness leads you to repentance. But say, no, I want you to save me, I want your goodness, but I don't want to be led to repentance. Then the person cannot be saved, all right? So that is why we still preach repentance. Yes, God will forgive. But if the person says, I only want forgiveness, I do not want to repent, I want to indulge in sin, then the desire is a false desire, right? A false faith, right? So hope you remember that. Now, the last question is this. Then the person asks, another person asks, at the same time, we shall not link to this, but it's the same concept. I understand that God works in an unbeliever's heart to cause them to believe in the gospel and turn to Christ. So this person said, I understand salvation is by irresistible grace. God works in me and then I repent and I turn to God. But now the question is this. Think about this. But when a born-again believer who have backslided, wandered away from the faith, eventually returns to God, now, this is the question. Is it because God worked in his heart, like salvation, or the individual has personally decided to do so? You understand the question? So, before salvation, yes, God is the one who moved and worked, and then we repent. But what about after salvation, when a person backslides and he's, the person returns to God? Is it because God worked, just like in salvation, or is it because the person decided individually, personally, to do so? Why do you think so? You understand the question, Michelle? understand okay we shall understand um, so your answer
Okay? So it's both. All right? It's both. Because the person, a true believer who is saved has the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will convict the believer of sin. So that is the work of God. Correct? So that's one part. Then the second part is the believer now has to choose to respond. So you both, right? What do you think? Do you agree, uh, Vincent? You agree. Uh, Jennifer? You agree? All agree. Now, that's, that's correct, all right? So again, there is, the Christian cannot be proud that I return to God. You cannot be proud. God very often is the one that moves either through chastisement or through conviction of sin. Now, but the difference between an unbeliever and a believer is this. An unbeliever must have irresistible grace working. Why? Claude, why must an unbeliever have irresistible grace? Otherwise, he won't, he won't repent. You understand the question? They have the original sin. Um, believers also have that. Um, us. I don't know who else to ask. All right. Uh, Cornelius again. <laughs> What's the difference between the unbeliever and believer? Why must the unbeliever have need to have irresistible grace? Otherwise, he will not repent. And the believer is not about irresistible grace anymore. Because God elected. Now, not ran out of time. Now, irresistible grace is needed because the person in the first place, his will, all right, his will is still depraved and there's nothing in him that would choose to repent, to choose God. Remember that? So when you're not saved, you only choose evil. You will not choose repentance. That is why irresistible grace is needed. But after salvation, remember, the will is restored, correct? The will is restored. Now when the will is restored, it can be resistible grace. It means the Holy Spirit can, can prompt you, can convict you, but you can, the Bible says you can grieve the Holy Spirit, remember? means you can actually resist the work of God and say, I don't want to repent. You can do that. But now you also have the restored will to say, I will repent. I want to choose to repent. All right? So that is how God works. Now, why is it important to understand all this? Again, number one, don't be proud when you repent. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit works in you, make sure you don't grieve the Holy Spirit, but you choose to repent. Young ones, can you learn that? That is how God works. You must understand the Holy Spirit working in your life and respond. Adults, likewise. All right? So I hope this clarifies a proper understanding of God's forgiveness. It's His gracious, long-suffering, forbearance, and so on. The Bible uses those words. Purely His goodness. His sovereign, suzerainty, covenantal goodness. Repentance is always our duty and we must respond to the working of the Holy Spirit. It's always, the, it's always God. Now, remember, I read to you, for it is God that which worketh in you, Philippians 2.13, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Paul told the believers, please don't be so proud. When you will to repent, it is God that works first. It is He that whenever you sin, He works. He moves towards you. That is how good God is. Don't reject. Don't, re don't resist Him. All right? Okay, let us... What do we have here? Top five reasons why church dropouts... Uh, what church dropouts say. Why they stop attending church? Now, please remember 66% of... Well, I take the American view. Um, they are the most readily available results. They stop attending church at least a year after turning 18. So from...